what frequency is best for a kick. This is the low end frequency range. The sub bass should be below 65 Hz. And when it comes to below 20 Hz, we humans can't hear it. Between 20 to 35 Hz, many systems will really have a hard time to reproduce. Between 55 to 65 Hz, it is the transition from bass to sub bass, and this area in some cases may feel weak. This left us only between 35Hz to 55Hz, so our kick and sub bass should sit around here. And if we translate this into the notes, the sweet spot is really E, F, G and A. The main idea here is taking the same patch, altering the envelopes, altering the unison and getting a bit smoother sound. Filter is different, envelope is different, more noise as well. It's like, uh, uh. why do we do this? This gives this really nice groove, like, uh, then, da -da, uh, then, da -da, uh. try to hear it. And if you listen together now, see how this adds up to the groove. The low end separation is creating a loudness difference between very low end of your track, say below 150 Hz, and the mid low range of your track, say 150 to 400 Hz. This will emphasize the bottom low end of your track while push back the mid low end of your track, meaning that while we keep the loudness overall the same because we are boosting the low end while decreasing the loudness of mid low end, we will make it feel like people feel more bass than it is. That's a thing that I've noticed online a lot. Oh, EDM pro tip. Tune your kick. Dude, shut up. BM producers these days like, oh, you gotta, you gotta tune your kick. You gotta tune your kick to the bass. I'm like, bro, kicks don't make bass. Kicks make kicks. <laughs> you, you got the loud dead mouse around. They are, they are really the best. Bass makes bass. Use bass for bass. You know, use a sub -osk or, you know, some kind of thing. You know what I mean? A kick drum is not a bass line. A kick drum is just literally, it could be a punchy little transient. It could be some... First, you have to consider the genres that you are making. For example, if you are making hard style or heavy techno, I would say the optimum length is somewhere around here. If you are making maybe progress files, this area could be your optimum length. If you are doing maybe hard style, this could be your optimum length. And when it comes to the key don't just go blindly tune every kick off to the root key consider try one third and fifth with these different color schemes so the first model that we are taking a look at is what is called the delay drop we will oftentimes start with high energy break and build up part at the beginning of the break the track will be quieter but it will be still more tilted to the high end and it will gradually get louder but when we reach the top we won't jump into the drop but we will do something that's called fermata and drop down the energy level. And the format oftentimes followed by a teller. The most popular one at the moment is a playing short lead sound to hint how the drop will sound. And right after this, we will see oftentimes is the track changes into red, meaning that we will focus on more to the mids and we try to use a tighter sound. The, the most energetic part of the drop comes way later than the original drop that we anticipated. According to my statistics, 45% of the people who are watching the videos actually haven't subscribed to the channel. If you are here more than 2-3 times and if you feel like these tutorials are adding something to you, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Prefix resampling means that creating a tail from an original sound and reversing it and then putting it in front of the original sample to create this more epic and drastic ambience.
2k utility and automate the beat so it comes super stereo and goes in the middle right before that this note hits and together they sound like this now comes the fun part if you want to even capture the filter behavior of sub 37 I think this is good. Now we're gonna capture this sound. Avoid the same steps. I did the same thing, right? Putting the wavetable here. And if we take off Slater B, take off the filter and all the effects. You can see again that slight pitch drift. What is happening here is actually we were just closing the cutoff filter, right? The sound gets dark. And now the fun part begins, what you can do with this type of sounds. What I took, for example, use the same wavetable, right? And then added a unison on top of that. And these are like one octave different from each other. So look at this, beautiful. And then you add a filter, super slight movement. And then of course you are adding the extra effects and look how beautiful it sounds in the end. All these are look juiciness together with this modern synth sound, color panning. Let's say we would like to pan this shaker. But we don't want to just move it to the right side, we would like to distribute it to the right side. You take something like this and put it on the placement and to the right. So we will boost the right side a little bit. You don't need to do this step, but I also like to take a little bit from the left, something like this. It will also kind of gain compensate itself. Without. Copy the last snare. If you ever play the drums, if you take the stick, hit and roll slowly on the snare drum, you will hear this friction sound together with the hit sound. So t -t 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 sound in between this snare, t -t 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 first one, a hit, and then the friction to decrease the attack so there's not the initial hit. And then finally, one more hit. And now you can even decrease the initial attack a bit more so that it's softer metal around the snare there should be a fast echo in the snare itself and for that part you should be using very fast delay so in this case i'm using just 34 milliseconds delay with a short feedback i will make the sound a bit more frictionless by adding a vocoder playing with the sound levels we have something like this and let's test how much difference it makes drums were especially loose and organic and the patterns were reminders of old jungle and garage beats. The funny thing is Burial actually used Soundforge for creating this album. Soundforge is not a DAW and it's mostly used for sample editing, which was probably the why the drums were so loose because there were no real quantization. So to emulate this in Ableton, the first thing that we are going to do is right click and deactivate the fixed grid. Wenn du 1,16 lässt, das hört sich so krass mechanisch an. Also klar, das ist halt Techno-Musik, aber das ist halt irgendwie so komplett gesetzt ist. But you can do Control U and then you can actually move things around a little bit or you can actually also apply a groove afterwards. So let's say we will gonna apply this like the Boris likes it. So the first one is polyrhythm. So on top we have the right, there's a one bar loop and the division is made into three. So we are hearing three right hits. On the bottom, again we have the same length, but this time we are having two hits. And because of that, we have two different rhythms hitting at different times, hence the name polyrhythms. For the polymeter, on top we have a loop for a bar, four hits. On the bottom, we have a rhythm that has a length of one and a half bar, six hits. In polymeters, the length is this time different, but the rhythm is the same, the divisions are same, they always hit the same time. So if we sum up, in polyrhythms, we have two different rhythms, the same length, but the division is different. In the polymeters, we have the same rhythm, divisions are the same, but the lengths are different. Big amateur mistake, compress everything. I see compression everywhere in amateur's track. Just don't use the compression if you are not really aware of what it's doing. Also Kompressoren benutze ich eigentlich nur beim Mastering, weder beim Mixing noch beim Lied selber. Das habe ich über die Jahre gelernt, weil da machst du einfach, finde ich, viel zu viel kaputt. The three version of it. 
just like that. Every hit will be slightly different. You can do it like this, like ta -ta 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 -ta. you can take like a tail, like this. And the tail can be a bit transposing this one a bit. Yeah. And maybe volume this up slightly. We can EQ it depending on how we feel with the other stuff. Something like this, right? We're gonna push this one to the left. So to the left and to the right. And in between one, we can make it a bit random. Yeah. First, I am having this FM from B. And on the B part, having something the alternative waveform. So I can bend. See how this affects the sound. And having these two aggressive envelope on top of that, the second envelope goes for the cutoff. And we are having this really resonant filter so that it's open. Extreme distortion on it. We have another filter so that we apply the same envelope here to get rid of all the super highs. Otherwise, it will be like this. <laughs> you don't want that. sound spreads through the medium of air and starts reflecting from right and left. The high frequency waves loses energy in the air faster than low frequency range. Hence it's harder for them to travel long distances. However, it is not really true for the low frequencies. Hence, when something happens really far away, we hear L of refraction and we hear L of low end. When a sound comes from underground, let's say earthly sounds, because earth is often solid material, high frequencies have much harder time to penetrate the solid material. And you can actually trick the ear by low passing the sound and making it feel like it's coming from underground. When we are outside, we don't have anything above our heads. When we hear something rich on the high end, we believe that the sound comes from high above. It's basically taking a percussive sound here. <laughs> it's kind of like an engine starting, right? But we are doing adding a bit vocoder, delay, cutting all the lows. And of course, other thing, we are automating this gain button so it gets brighter. And auto pan pans it around while moving. So creating this really authentic effects other than classic cheese risers. To start with, I want to distort it really. And I'm going to use the trash for this. Here we go. I'm gonna put an EQ. I feel like it's distorting too much those highs. I'm gonna make a sub bass to just to balance these two together. I just layered the F so that we will have the driving F sound and I'm gonna go for my pigments. So what I'm going to do, go here. Together with the kick. Just randomly pick a sample, a loop, any loop, doesn't matter which loop that you pick. I'm gonna tune it down all the way. So you can definitely hear that I'm really interested on these super lows. Here you can see a bit more and such in the kick. So this is just automation of that sidechain amount or threshold in this case. It gives this kind of nice interesting contrast together with the kick. This time I have this sample. Kind of white noise and I just took the high end of this one. So it feels like we are in the warehouse. It gives just a bit air to the sound. It makes the bass somehow feel bigger than it is. Having this really white on top. One more time. This time I found the sample. Like deep bass sound and just move it around here. So it creates kind of machine sound and together again. And of course a bit EQ here. This is another very fun old school technique. A little bit old school vocals would work real nice on this. Smoke up, that's in the blem. Free up the guys, then depart. Take a listen here. That's in the blem. That's in the blem. Put a sampler, and then you put this sample inside this. Cup, that's in the go to pitch, ac activate the pitch envelope. The first thing that we are going to do, the amount to 12. You can go any number, it really doesn't matter, because it's not really tonal sound. Cup, that's in the blem. It's like initial sound, but we will give this an attack, so to make it a bit more pronounced. But now I want this one to go down like that, and bring down the sustain. <laughs> but I don't want this to super obvious, so I'm gonna give it a bit more decay. So, so that we can feel that really vinyl stop effect. And then a bit release. You can also change the curve style, like here, if you increase it. Something like this, right? If, if you don't want to have it really dark. 
This is like the final piece that you can do. That's in the bloom. That's in the bloom. Something like this. That's in the bloom. That's in the bloom. You can do one more layer on this one and it's like uh uh cut in the bloom. Uh uh cut in the bloom. We will use indeed exact the same method first. I duplicate it three times here. Da -da -da, so the and of course picking a different curve so it sounds a bit darker. Co -co 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 Let's try it together. That's in the bloom. I actually stalk a little bit Boris Prachel's YouTube videos to understand what he is doing. He mentioned a lot of times that he is just using Fabulity One. This is just single oscillator synthesizer, nothing really more than that. And the main stereo effect was actually coming from the Timeless, a Fab Filter plugin again. And there was just chorus effect in the sound or chorus like effect, uh, I would say basically. And it's, as you can see, the low end is actually cut. So the super low below 56 there is still mono. And on top of that, I just used the bass mode to make it everything mono below 64 so that the super subs are mono, but the rest is I'm giving a with room to be stereo so it sounds like this while beatport was taken by neve and popular kids past three years there was one legendary track that nobody has really ever forgotten and the name of the track is actually house music anthem by marshall jefferson and the story goes like this Despite pressing the track early, Move Your Body was not released by Tracks Records because labor owner Larry Sherman didn't like the track and he believed that it is not really house music. And this led to Marshall Jefferson to add the house music anthem to the title of the track rather than calling it Move Your Body. And it was again that time the British journalists came to the Chicago to take a look at this blooming house music movement in Chicago. And according to the story, they visited five different clubs in Chicago and every one of them was playing house music anthem or the movie or buddy at the time. And the crowd reaction was extremely positive to the track and everybody was going crazy. And it is said that it is this reaction from the crowd and the club led the track to be released on the track's records. And Jefferson himself commented actually, it probably never would have come out but it had gotten so big in all clubs in Chicago, it had to be released. The track got so iconic. If we were to look at who sampled who, you will see that there are 71 different songs actually sampled house music anthem. It's mind blowing how much a crowd can change the story of a song. I want to create this really weird ambience. I just want that emphasis, like the resonance on top. I'm gonna push it into the distortion and amp. So we have the amp first. Ooh. And pedal on top. Ooh. Putting into the really big ping pong delay to create this like super ambience on top. Reverb. So let's try. compression is simple. When you go above the threshold, we compress the signal and alter the shape of the attack and the decay. But it is not always what we want actually. On parallel drum compression, we use extreme settings on compression so that we really bring down the volume levels. And because settings are fast and extreme, we will have this initial super spiky attack left. And because this is a parallel compression, we actually sum up the original signal on top of the parallel signal, creating this really bulky fat signal. So I have this small break right here, but I need the enhanced ambience and I want to use back melody to do that. Remember, back melody, we don't go for too much contour, we don't need something super complicated. The main focus is enhancing the ambience. Isn't this beautiful? So if you play... Almost feels like we can add another background sound here just to enhance the beginning of the drop again or the beginning of the rhythm again. Remember what we did in the techno track creating this kind of not following the rules. It was something like this and we're gonna use the same idea but this time we go something a bit less dramatic. Something like this. So let's try one more time to get a bit track.
isn't that just so beautiful? Talking about using returns and using parallel chains. The other thing worth mentioning, I guess, is like on the drums especially. I'll use two sends actually. I'll use like a room send. And it's it's just a, like an Ableton reverb, like two and a half seconds and the low end's taken out and it's side chained a bit. It's pretty simple. But I think if you send everything to one room, it sounds like the music's all kind of together rather than like putting individual reverbs on each channel. And then the other send that I usually use is like a bit of distortion and compression. So the drums are being sent to like a tube warmer kind of that's like driving it a bit and distorting yeah. and then compressing it. Essentially parallel compression just done as a send. And it makes a really, really big difference, especially with getting your track to be like sort of competitive on a loudness level, like without it and then Yeah, totally. This term is something that I created myself, but I think it explains quite well. Uh, I call them micro and micro arrangement. Micro arrangement means that shuffling the track by using four to 16 bar loops and creating a concrete idea or a story for your track. In micro arrangement, transitions, automations, effects are really not important. And you shouldn't spend any time on them until you are happy with the main idea and the story of your track. There are two different macro arrangement styles. The first one is called top-down approach and the second one is called bottom-up approach. Again, these two terms are something that I created, but I explain why I call them this way. And top-down arrangement, we can actually simplify it to the three steps. First, you create your chorus so that you have as much elements that you can have in a 16 or 2, 32 bar loop. And step two is just copy pasting this loop all over the track. And step three will be just deleting the elements that you don't feel like belongs to the, those different structures. What people is using is EQ flaps. Here you can see on the master I have a channel EQ and both lows and highs are automated. Rather than using it on the master, I have a white noise here, just white noise with the reverb. But you often see is that the low end is gradually shelled. In the master you will often see like minus three to minus six, but let's exaggerate it and put it back minus eight here. And on the high end you can either boost it or you can also attenuate it. I like cutting it off because this kind of balances all the cutoff automations that we will do later on. So it turns the white noise into this. Don't trust your ear when you are mixing your low end. Every room, if it is not treated, has a room mode. That means that what you hear while you are sitting in your chair is not the same what you should be hearing. One of the most common frequency response for a living room. For example, you will be hearing 40 Hz, almost 20 dB louder than what you are hearing 60 Hz. It is huge and this is only the one side of the coin. And depending on the resonance in your room, actually you will have also ringing of the frequency is meaning that some of the frequency will be uh, reverbing longer than others like this one right around 40 hertz for example here that rings at that reverberates so that it will be sustained longer while the others are shorter i will just demonstrate this one i created this eq not exactly the same but similar to the one that we've seen it's not exactly right to do like this but it's a good way to demonstrate the point overtones and undertones. Let's play a G on piano. These are overtones and these are the undertones. And overtones and undertones actually define the timbre of an instrument and they are really important. However, there is one mind-blowing fact about the overtones. I have a simple sawtooth. Now take a look at our overtones. Overtones are produced on each integer multiplier. So 100, 200, 300, we can see it there. If we put this one octave up now, so G2, now we have the overtones 200, 400, 600. Because of this multiplication, lower octaves would have tighter harmonies because like 100, 200, 300, 400. That is why when you put auto T on lower pitch sound, auto T pushes those higher harmonics up and they tend to sound richer compared to the higher harmonics. Mind blowing, isn't it? When you're thinking about your stereo field, you need to think about the triangle, right? Here, you should be mono and then go slightly enhancing more, less mono, less mono, and quite a bit stereo. Because of that synth coming in, bleeding in, we are actually having this a bit stereo field here. I'm gonna bring this down. And then I'm gonna go to second. Again, synth and effects are bleeding in so making it a bit too stereo to the sound the problem here if you keep this part too stereo you won't be really appreciating the stereo feel here so we have to bring down that stereo more here and 
ada nego ya. And final here. Now we can go a bit here. You see sometimes fast drop down here, not really matter too much. Again, AB, always. First thing is the ceiling note. The ceiling note is the highest note on the arpeggio. This is the floor note and this is of course the lowest note in the arpeggio. The central note on the other hand is the note that the other things gravitate towards. And the one last thing is where the arpeggio is gravitating towards. And if you take a look at this specific arpeggio, we have upper focus at the first half and the lower focus at the second half. So this type of pattern is called shout and fall. No, it's not something that I created myself, it's actually in the literature. The name derives from arpeggiation oscillating between the ceiling note and the floor note. So we are shouting here and we are falling down. We are shouting, we are falling down. To make this even more analog sounding, we're gonna activate the noise and then we're gonna go to cutoff and modulation source and then we're gonna pick that noise. So pay attention how the filter gets unstable and creates filter noise when I increase this. Of course we don't want it this much. Do you see how analog it started to sound? All together now. Even though you make a plucky bass sound, you have to sustain your sub end because we feel the sub bass and the short envelopes can't make us feel it. Which one is easier to hear? It's much easier to hear the higher pitch, isn't it? And this is related to the actual Fletcher Manson curve. We humans tend to favor the mid range more and hear more easily compared to the low end. But this, of course, doesn't mean that you cannot have a plucky bass with the sustained sub end. So, what you can do basically have two separate sounds. On the top harmonics, you can have a higher pitch bass sound, very plucky, but you can layer with this with more sustained sub end, and then you can actually enjoy the best of the both world. We have plucky body under this more sustained sub bass. You don't even realize the sub is actually really sustained. Because our brain focuses on higher pitch sound. But if you want to avoid layers, there's one more way to do this. When you're creating your bass sound, separate your filter envelope and your volume envelope. In Serum, really straightforward. The first envelope is always the volume envelope. So what you can do, have sustain on the volume envelope itself. But the filter envelope, you can go very plucky. It means that the filter is moving very fast, but the volume is sustained. And this leads to this beautiful sound. In old times, one of the big problems was actually the sustained sounds. For example, three time. And let's say I want to have a sustained sound. Old school jungle tracks sold this this way. We duplicate the same sound and then we go into the warp mode and pick the repitch and then double the tempo. Three time. And this actually sounds too much like Warcraft. Three time. <laughs> I cannot unhear it. <laughs> And then we do the same thing again one more time. And then you add them together. And a bit effects on top. And if you still don't remember how it was, it was something like this. 